Uh, hey, everybody. Thank you for coming out today, um, especially at the end of a, uh, a long week of South by Southwest, and especially for coming out at 5 o'clock on St. Patrick's Day. I can't tell you how much we appreciate that. Um, we're here today to talk about the top uh, title of the uh, panel here is uh, Shanghai to Siberia, looking at new frontiers in gaming. And just to sort of set the stage of what we'll be discussing today, um, there is a rapid expansion going on in the video game world, and it's been North America and European, uh, Euro European countries and uh, Japan, but there are areas that are starting to take off, and just to single out uh, one of those, um, a recent survey from Nico Partners said that gaming revenue in China was top, is going to top $26 billion this year across all platforms. Um, last year, that same group says that the Chinese mobile market actually surpassed the U.S. market. And at the same time, Nuzu, another analytical firm, said that in December 2015, China was the country with the biggest game revenues, with $22 billion, and that was about $265 million more than the U.S. market. Brazil came in 11th, Russia was 12th. Um, so with that as sort of our, uh, our initial talking points, I want to have our panelists introduce themselves and uh, tell you a little bit about what they do and uh, the companies they're with. So hi, my name is Mike Burke. Uh, I'm not Chris Early, which I know his name was on the, uh, on the flyer, uh, but he had an emergency, so he asked me to fill in. Uh, Chris and I work together on the emerging markets uh, issues. I'm the global communications director for Ubisoft, so um, one of the issues that we tackle as part of my team is emerging markets uh, and the strategies within those. We uh, talked with Chris last year at GDC about this topic and, and card, uh, started to think about this idea a little bit more, and so happy to be here today and, and talk with you guys. Cool. Hello, my name is Jay Cohen. I'm the general manager of Wargaming America. We're based in Emeryville, California. Uh, our purview of Wargaming America is to operate the live service for World of Tanks, World of Warships on, on all platforms, PC, console, mobile. Um, and we oversee uh, our player audience, the service for the player audience in throughout North and South America. So for this topic specifically, we've, we've been focusing a lot of attention uh, in Latin America and Brazil specifically. So I hope to be able to uh, enlighten uh, the conversation a little bit there. Great. Hey everyone, my name is Julia. Um, I work for Facebook and we manage strategic partnerships with developers across Europe and that includes um, Russia and CIS just the Eastern European region. And so our role is to essentially help developers build, grow, and monetize their um, games across platforms, and essentially advising them on um, strategies on emerging markets and next regions they should be going into, um, and so on. And this is my very first time in Austin. I'm super excited to be here, um, and super excited about the discussion. With Great. You well, first question, can everyone hear all of the panelists, or are we good on that? Good? All right. Second off, if anyone needs a copy of Little Red Riding Hood, there are about 75 up here for some reason, and I have no idea why. Um, so let's kick it off. Just in terms of, of finance, um, what is the financial potential of these markets? How big can they get? Sure. So when you, uh, I mean, my, a lot of my experience comes from like Russia and, and that region. So that's probably the one I can speak the most about. Um, so depending on the source, I think Russia is about 1.3 to 1, 1.5 billion. Um, and that's growing exponentially, essentially. And I guess um, the guys from Wargaming can, can second that. Um, it is very much a PC dominated market. So MMO um, and uh, kind of browser that area has been growing really really fast and continues to do so so PC probably 98% of mixed 98% of um, kind of the whole gamers um, in Russia uh, but mobile as well has been blowing up so um, I think between 2014 and 2015 um, the revenues grew about 68% or something like that which is amazing obviously due to the weakness of the ruble uh, the growth between 2014 and 2015 has slowed down quite a lot, um, but the future is looking optimistic. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, uh, for, for, for our perspective of wargaming, you know, being in, in free to play, uh, we focus on players and, and, and scale. 
So if you look at markets, obviously like Russia or, or Brazil and throughout Latin America, um, we're focused on players. Players first. The, the, the finance and economics will catch up uh, with you eventually if you have a good game and if you have a game that you can hold on to the player for a long time. Um, now, there might be some up and downs, as we see, uh, economically speaking or politically speaking. You, you, know, you look at Argentina, um, Brazil right now, and, and Russia. But for us, we focus on the, the, the player base, uh, all about scale, because you can't have a successful PvP game uh, at scale without players. And uh, you know, we, we don't just focus on pairs, it's players. Uh, so I think when you say, you know, what's the potential, uh, we think it's huge because uh, especially in Brazil, um, look at the mobile market exploding. Eventually, it will catch up and it will monetize because it continues to scale immensely. It's you know what, 180 million people. Um, so uh, that's what we focus on first: player first, uh, and economics uh, eventually will come. And Jake, if you could, do, you have any uh, specific information on potential in, in China? Since we've talked a little bit about Russia. I'm, I'm sorry, Jay. I mean, Mark, Mark I'm sorry. Um, so I think some of the figures that you cited, you know, it's, for us, it's the same. We see those same figures. Um, one thing that maybe you didn't cite but, but stuck in the back of my mind um, when we were talking about this last year is for every U.S. citizen, there's 1.6 gamers, 1.6 Chinese gamers. So <laughs> the opportunity there is, is just enormous. Now, that's based on the sheer size of their population, obviously. But... What that means is opportunity for us to find these players and to work with these players. Um, you know, th the numbers aren't quite as big, but in Brazil, you've got 200 million basically online technophile players. So um, in Russia, we're seeing uh, high-speed connectivity rates increase dramatically. I think 60% uh, or moving up to 80% um, in the coming years. 80% uh, of players are going to have high-speed connections. So um, for us, I think if, if I can talk about one part of the market where we see a lot of opportunity, it's in digital. Um, that includes mobile, but it also includes uh, full digital PC sales. For us, that's a big opportunity in, in Brazil, in, in China, and in, uh, and in Russia. That's a, a really big focus for us. Well, what are they playing over there? Is it the, the same games that we see in, in Western and European markets, or is, it a, uh, is the interest different among players? Um, it's, it's both, I think. Uh, I think they are playing, you know, if you make a very good Western game, uh, then people, players in the East will want to play it. If, um, you know, these are global brands now. Um, you know, Jason, you said you focus on the players, and I, and I think that's right. I think what Ubisoft focuses on is we want to build a, a, global, a global brand and a global world uh, that players from all over the place can get involved in that they want to be a part of. So um, if you do it right, if you build a brand um, like an Assassin's Creed or a division where people are interested around the world, then that's the start. The second part of it is you have to make sure you're working with local partners and local talent and that you, know, you have local development teams who can help customize the game or tailor the game to that local audience's need. So we do that in, we do that in China, we do that in Russia. We have teams there that are actually you know, working with partners who, who understand the market even better than we do uh, and can help adjust those games and make them uh, more relevant, more viable for, for local players. Yeah, and I guess just to add to that on mobile um it's really interesting if you look at like top downloads and top grossing charts if you look at russia and brazil for example most of them are dominated by western developers so like supercell uh machine zone and these kind of guys are very very popular so they make up probably like 90 percent of the top top 25 charts right whereas china is somewhat different because obviously it is a very uh different market um um, largely dom dominated by big publishers like Tencent and Baidu and 360 and so on. But there you s see hardly any Western developers. So probably Supercell is the only one that uh, managed to break through and even them uh, working with, um, uh, with the local partners and lo local publishers and so on. And Jay, this, this time to the real Jay. Uh, <laughs> it, it, world of Tanks is, is enormous over in Russia. It's a worldwide game, but that's sort of where it has its hub. Um, is, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, how the audience breaks down for sure. that? Yeah, and I well, I think oh, that, that dovetails to the previous question, in right. fact. I mean, uh, you know, to simplify, I, I wouldn't, 
discount, we, we don't discount local taste and local flavor for sure and, and what kind of games, you know, maybe speak better to, to specific markets. Uh, however, we think it's more about the last mile, if you will, to use that analogy. And, and the, the, the distance between uh, the game and the customer uh, has gotten uh, a lot smaller. So it, it, we, we feel it's more about um, how you cater locally uh, to the player. So uh, you have a great game, um, you bring the game into, uh, into a region and you cater uh, to the player, you connect with the player, you come to South By, you sit with the player, um, you do the player gatherings and the community events and that's what cultivates and actually drives uh, ultimately uh, your sustainability uh, in fact. So it's not necessarily uh, tailoring specifically the content like a game of World of Tanks. Uh, World of Tanks uh, really speaks to a Russian player um, contextually. Um, uh, why? Because of World War II and the historical nature and you go to a park and you'll see uh, a museum that's dedicated to tanks or a statue. You won't find that here, but it's no less successful. Um, but we cater to our player base a, a, a bit differently uh, in what we do and how we speak uh, to them because we don't have tanks in the streets, if you will, but the game is no different and it's no less fun. So, okay. so here in the U.S., uh, the payment model is, is pretty standard. You pay 60 bucks or so for a game, um, you might buy some DLC, and, uh, and that's kind of the way you are. Or you can do free-to-play where you do microtransactions and pay it from there. Is that model similar in these emerging regions, or are you looking at something just completely different? Uh, I think we're looking at something very, very different. So uh, both China and Russia are very similar in that sense where free-to-play is totally king. I think that happens for several reasons, I guess. One of them is uh, just the pure culture and nature of gaming in those markets. Um, because the way people think about paying for content is very different. They, they really enjoy kind of trying things before they buy them. Um, and just being able to, you know, have access to something that they might play, pay for later. And I think culturally, people are just a lot more impulsive when they come to uh, when it comes to purchases in those markets. Whereas in the US, I think people are a lot more um, used to budgeting when it comes to anything, not just gaming. Right? They they think about their mortgage and they think about the budget for their like car expenses and school fees and and so on. Whereas um, in Russia and so much in China. Um, people are just kind of doing those things on whim a lot. So mm -hmm. I think that's why you'll see a lot of that kind of disparity um, in those markets. And also, I think um, just the way the class system is structured there as well. So you'll see a big disparity in the social system between people who are, um, I guess, a lot more well off and those who are not. And so free to play is a perfect model for that because you'll it's largely based on a small population of people who are spending a huge amount per, per transaction um, and so on. So yeah, uh, and I guess piracy is another question when it comes to, um, to those local markets yeah. because historically there has been kind of, the content hasn't really been localized, when, especially when it comes from the West for, for those markets. And so if it's not really there, directly from developers and publishers, people will find other ways to access it and it's usually through either torrents or pirate um, downloads and so on. And so a lot of that history has really shaped it. Um, and so free to play is pretty much the way to go. And um, I think in all three markets, Brazil, China and Russia. And Mike, you, your company mm -hmm. and Ubisoft is probably a little bit, would seemingly be a little bit more prone to piracy than, um, than, than maybe you, Jay, and I'm curious on your thoughts on this too, but uh, so how do you uh, protect your IP and, uh, and deal with that, in, especially in countries like Russia and China where it's just out of control? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to Russia specifically. I, I, I wouldn't say it's out of control. I, I think what I would say is that we, you know, we know that, that for in the Russian market that um, you know there maybe was a, a problem with piracy or an issue that with piracy that we had to address. Um, but one of the things that we've seen, and, and Julie, you kind of mentioned this, is uh, well, there are a couple reasons. There are probably three reasons, and one of them is um, kind of an emerging middle class that's happening in China too. That's happening in Russia too. So we're seeing an emerging middle class. 
where people do want to pay to get the latest games, whether that be a, a free-to-play game or whether that be a more traditional console title or whether that be a mobile title. You know, they, they, want, to, they want to pay for the latest and greatest thing. They want to be a part of that gaming community. The, the second point um, is that there's really, um, you know, these games are moving more and more online, whether or not they're free-to-play. We were talking about um, The Division, which is a game that Ubisoft released last week. Um, and it has, you know, it, it has multiplayer features, it has uh, team play features, all of these things are online. And the community that's playing these games, they're going to be online. Um, and so, you know, simply because players in Russia want to be a part of that community, they want to be playing on the official Ubisoft servers with the rest of the division players in Russia, they're going to be online. And that, that is, you know, a, a pretty effective piracy deterrent as well. Um, but as Jay said, it's more about the players. It's more, can you bring those players together in a community? And that's what they want. They want to, they want to be there. So I would say those are the two, you know, for us, the, those are the two big things that we look at in, in Russia and, and as well in, in Brazil and China. Yeah, I think for, for us, I, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this, but uh, I don't have to think about piracy. With, with free to play, and yeah. that, I mean, and that's really where the model emerged from, right? And and for wargaming specifically, it was like, a, a, you know, how did they get out of um, a developer who was focused on strategy games and building, you know, box product, um, and finding it hard to survive because of piracy in their own uh, region? Said, so, you know, how do we maneuver around that, and how do we build a model? Um, that can speak uh, to um, eliminating uh, piracy concern, number one. Uh, but ec the economic model portion was, I think, you know, the concept of, of disposable income and um, how do you address that vis-a-vis um, -vis a microtransaction uh, model which says, okay, look, you, know, you don't need to come out of your pocket with 50, 60, 70 dollars or with VAT, a box product, 80, 90 dollars. Um, you know, go to Brazil. I mean, it's 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 a shame. You know, yeah. those guys have to pay a hundred dollars for uh, a box product, um, and which is twice what we pay here. But yet we know the disposal income um, is not the same. So we do cater uh, or or see different dynamics uh, within our store uh, across different regions about what can be more successful and what we offer. You know, in Brazil, the way. Uh, What's the cadence of their paycheck? Is it a little different? You know, let's say it's on a monthly basis, and so people are going to run out of money by the end of the week. So there's no reason to run a special. Mm. I mean, for example, at the end of the month, because nobody's going to be there, they're they're waiting. So we we, we look at those uh, type of things uh, to consider. Is that something that you guys have to consider also? That's a very interesting point about, you know, as you say, the cadence of the paycheck. Um, is that one of the factors that you study as you're timing promotions and sales and things like that? That's to me. Yeah. Either, yes. Uh, sure, yeah. It depends on the market, right? But we have to look at every market uniquely. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't kind of apply a broad um, marketing strategy or, or comm strategy in these places. Um, you, you do need to look at the, what the customer is capable of, what do they want. Um, you need to look at the, the regulations and the taxes that are, that are applicable. Like you said, the value-added tax in Brazil is, is, uh, you know, can be a bit punitive. And so we need to look at that and, and decide how we how we adjust our prices based on that. You know, for us, um, I hesitate to call them box products because I, I don't I feel like we're moving away from that, right? Um, and we're going towards more digital uh, digital products, full, even full digital products. So, um, but but for those, we have to look at the market and we have to let the market decide. You know, we we price our we do our best to price all of our games competitively in these in these emerging markets. Um, and and we're always adjusting. We're always looking at what's going on in the market um, in order to do that. Do you have anything to add, or? Yeah, I think that's pretty well. Okay. Well, how about this? You know, we've we've talked, kind of laid the groundwork then of what these these markets are like. Let's look at how they impact some of the trends that are starting to occur in the video game industry. And I think a good place to start, Julia, is your suggestion um, before the panel is esports. I mean, how do they fit in? Is the viewership growing in these areas for esports? And how do you leverage the audience, even if they can't afford the games? Sure. I think. Um, just the nature of esports, I think, is very mu it very much emerged from APAC markets, right? Um, so China is definitely the home of esports in that sense. And so, again, just to, due to the nature of the population of the country and obviously half a billion players in general um, in China, just creates this massive 
playing field, right, for, mm -hmm. for esports to emerge. Um, and then, so there's obviously, we can talk about esports and we can talk about just like influencers and YouTubers and, and just the gaming content out there. Um, so both of these, I think, increment, uh, exponentially growing in, in all three of the markets just because people love this stuff and it's, it's free to watch. Um, so competitive sports are definitely massive. Yeah, I would add, I mean, it's, it's extraordinarily exciting because uh, as we were discussing before, uh, as long as you have a connection, no matter where in the world you are, you can be the smallest town in Siberia with a connection, you can become the next uh, great professional player in whatever game it is, World of Tanks, Dota, LOL, I mean, and, and, and th this is how things are going to, to happen. And we, we see a lot of teams um, in, in, uh, in our professional league uh, who are connecting with individuals from multiple countries. So they arrive as a, as a team to an event and they're from five different countries throughout Europe, but yet, you know, uh, they've been playing together and this is how they got together. Um, and it's a great avenue and you, you're, we're creating all these amazing uh, human stories about, you know, where are these people emerging from? They're emerging from their bedroom. I mean, literally. So, uh, it's, and it's pretty exciting. Or actually, they're not emerging from their bedroom because they're spending all their time <laughs> playing. Um, but it's kind of, I guess in a way you could say it's like a democratization uh, of, uh, of, the, of the ability for people uh, to compete uh, across the world. So we're, we're going to only continue to see a massive uptick uh, in, in viewership day by day or over the next decade. I'm convinced. And, and uh, Mike, let me ask you this. I mean, and, and to follow up what I was saying, we, so we've got esports, but how do you leverage that audience for the people who, who can't afford the games? How do you leverage the viewers in that and monetize them? Uh, I don't know that we think first about monetizing them. I'm not sure that's the way to approach it. I think the way that we think about it is, you know, do you have the, do you have the brand first? And then we think about how do you take that successful brand or that popular brand and, and, and turn it into entertainment? Um, and by turning it into entertainment, uh, I know we're at the video game part of South by Southwest, but um, you know, there are movies here, there's music here, there's a lot of other entertainment that people engage in, and video game brands, the successful ones, are, are branching beyond uh, just video games. So, um, for instance, in Kuala Lumpur, right, we uh, announced that we're going to be opening a theme park there. Those people uh, may not be playing, they may not be buying Assassin's Creed games, but they may get exposed to the Assassin's Creed brand by, by the virtue of going to this theme park that's, that's local, that's in their neighborhood, and that provides them a totally different experience. Um, we're, gonna be a, we're gonna be launching an Assassin's Creed movie December 21st. December 21st, everyone mark it on your calendar. Um, Marketing guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, you know what? And that's, that's another way of... I'd like a ticket to that premiere, please. Okay, we can, <laughs> work, we can work it out after that. Plus one. Um, you know, that's, that's another way of getting people who, who, who may not be players, but they're going to be viewing the brand now. They're going to be exposed to this brand and engaged in this brand in a different way. And so that's, that's the way we think about it. We think about first creating the, the successful world and the brand and then expanding it out and, into as many different forms of, of entertainment as we can. And just to add to that, I guess the way you think about monetization of um, esports content is very much like any other competitive sport where a lot of it comes from brand advertising and so mm -hmm. leagues are sponsored by people like Red Bull and, and the big brands and so on. Uh, and so the viewership uh, is really about the community. I don't think there is. Uh, publishers are thinking about monetizing this because it's very much a retention and engagement play. Um, how to get the community together. And I'm sure a lot of, eventually, a lot of real like players and monetization comes out of it as a, you know, indirect um, result, but it's, it's very, very much about building a strong community and a strong brand among okay. players. Yeah. You, sorry, go ahead, uh, I, I, I would have to agree, I mean, it's spot on. It's, it's the ecosystem. I mean, we're, we're thrilled. I'm, we're, I'm, we're sitting here, I think, as, uh, you know, uh, content creators, um, we're thrilled because, I mean, come on, ESPN launching an eSports site, Yahoo launching an eSports site, um, ESPN launching, you know, um, I think the guy earlier uh, who was one of the co-owners of the Sacramento Kings who owns a professional, uh, you know, energy, uh, a law team who said, okay, you know, he said on stage, you know, Shaq and A-Rod are joining his staff because he's bringing on, you know, alongside all the sports psychologists that they're uh, using to develop their teams. I mean, all this stuff is awesome for us because, 
uh, it's going to just continue to expand um, uh, viewership and viewership is going to just help uh, folks like us um, introducing uh, the product to people who we normally or uh, couldn't reach effectively uh, to get the message out. Um, I can't sit over every single uh, potential player's shoulder to, to, to expand upon what's so amazing about World of Tanks as much as I would like to. I want to do it one person at a time, but we can't. So it, it's, it's uh, I think that's, that, that's where we net out on the monetization. I'm not looking to monetize the, the viewer mm -hmm. um, this, necessarily. Ultimately, if they start to come back to play the game, finding new players, that, that's where it will happen. You can't walk uh, 15 feet um, anywhere in downtown Austin right now without someone slapping a VR headset on your face. Um, so it's, it's obviously one of the bigger topics of the show. So let's, let's take a look at how that is, is going to work in these, uh, in these markets. Uh, VR is it's expensive. Um, it's brand new. I mean, you know, we're not even uh, at, in, the, in the first quarter of the game. We're doing the tailgating out in the parking lot at this point. Um, and I'm not sure what the distribution um, level is going to be for things like Rift and, and Vive and, and so forth, but you do have Google Cardboard, which is cheaper and, and more available. So uh, that's kind of a long-winded way of asking, you know, are you expecting VR to play um, a role that is around the same level as we're going to see in Western markets um, in these areas, or is it going to be slower to catch up? Again, I think uh, obviously it is very, very early days for VR in terms of both hardware and um, and people using it and so on. So we can only make predictions at this stage. But I think when talk, thinking about emerging markets, again, it's all going to come down to culture and how people like um, think about buying new gadgets and new tech and so on. So I think from my point of view, Russia will be really interesting because um, again, coming back to the point about like social class and status, which is very important for people in, in Russia and they're always, even though incomes might be nowhere near to what people have in the US, but um, if you ever travel to Moscow, everybody has the latest iPhone <laughs> um, and like a gamer has invested a ton of money into having like latest PC and stuff and they, they like to be seen with with the latest piece of um, hardware and stuff. So I think VR could potentially fall into that space as well and people would want to kind of jump on the brand new shiny thing and um, buy a VR headset, whether it's um, like mobile gear VR or whether it's actually, actually like the proper PC rift and, and so on. Whereas China, I'm not sure. I think people will be a lot more cost conscious just because, you know, of the nature again about mm -hmm. Uh, of how people think about um, the, what they spend their money on and so on. Um, and Brazil will probably be somewhere in between, I would imagine, but again, hard to say. I think I just want to build on the cultural point. I, I do think that that's going to be an interesting thing to watch. I, I don't think anyone knows the answer for certain right now, but a lot of the VR experiences, uh, at least initially, were, were very much you know isolationist almost. You're focused on putting the headset on and, and that was it. You tune out and and you're and you're sort of disappearing from from the world. Um, you know, one of the things that Ubisoft we've been we've been focusing on with the VR experience is how to make those social, mm -hmm. um, how to bring other people in and make sure that you're still playing with other people. You know, we talked about this for for online games. Um, we've talked about this for open world games. Is how do you get other people involved? So that's something we're focusing on as well. Um, we've got a we've got a game in development called Eagle Flight. We've got another one called Werewolves Within. Um, both of those were announced recently, and they both focus on this social aspect um, of the virtual reality experience. You're not by yourself. You are in this virtual world, but you're in it with other people. You're competing against them. You're playing with them, um, and that for me is what's going to be culturally interesting because I think. We, we think it will work for Western markets. We think it will work here because it's already working in our other games, in our, in our open world, in our connected games. So we need to see, did, will that same idea of, of social connectivity in a virtual space, will that work in, in emerging markets as well? But time will tell. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. In countries like Brazil, people are naturally very open and they are very social and they love their carnivals and things like that. And I think that will be very much um, it is already replicated in digital and like online and mobile gaming space. People love playing with each right. other and so on. Um, and I think VR will be no different, so it's a very good point. 
Um, we're going to go a little off script. I'll warn you three. We didn't talk about this one beforehand. I know, I know. But talk to me about the impact of politics um, in these markets. I mean, China, there are so many restrictions. The rules change um, at a pretty rapid clip. Um, Russia has certainly some taboo topics that, that you can't approach. Um, you know, how much does that have to be factored in as you are building a business there and building a customer base? Let me take it. I, I'm throwing it out there. It's all script. Anyone okay. can do with this one, yeah. I mean, isn't that one of the things you're not supposed to talk about, like a cocktail party is politics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Um, uh, we were, you know, we were present. Ubisoft was present with the launch of the consoles in China, uh, both the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4. Um, we had five games uh, available for the launch of Xbox 4 for PlayStation. Um, but the console market is still very, very nascent in China. Um, and I bring that up because one of the reasons for that that we see is the, you know, is censorship and, the, and that there's a long approval process of working with the government in order to get those games approved and into the market. Um, so, so absolutely, we do have to work with, you know, within the laws, within the regulations of the land, and that does affect your ability to be in these markets. I would say globally, in, in emerging markets, those are the two biggest uh, challenges, maybe opportunities as well, is you have economical challenges that can come up and you have political challenges that can come up and those are, you know, those are interrelated, right? Um, so, so yes, we, we do have to be aware of that. We always have to be cognizant of that. And I think the best way that you can do that is to have local presence and local partners. If you're trying to uh, get into these markets without that, you're gonna face a, a, a much higher hurdle. Um, you know, we've been in China for, uh, I think more than 18 years now. Uh, with offices in Chengdu and Shanghai, so we have people that understand how the business operates there and, and what they need to do in order to be successful, and that is, that's, that's huge for us. And I would assume that's the case for you also, Jay, with Wargaming based out of Russia. You learn to kind of work that. Yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, there, there, you could say there's, there's, for me, maybe two ways of looking at it. You know, uh, one, uh, would be looking at uh, countries and governments uh, on the political side, you know, who's interested in cultivating uh, interactive entertainment, and most are. Uh, in fact, most, you know, first world and, and second uh, world countries uh, because they realize this, this is where we are. This is pop culture, this is happening. Um, so if you want to connect uh, and build your economy, uh, we connect with your people, build your economy, uh, look to places where, you know, politically speaking, they're encouraging uh, development, you know, vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, the inter interactive entertainment industry. So the, on, on one hand, um, and you look, I, I can't speak to China, uh, but, you know, in Russia, you know, very open. They, 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 uh, we have great relations. We have a lot of uh, significant relations, in fact, um, because they recognize uh, the impact on society uh, that games can have, you know, positively. Uh, even in Brazil, um, there's a lot of initiatives to uh, to cultivate uh, the independent developer community, you know, giving financial incentives, et cetera. So that's one way. You know, the second way of looking at it uh, might be, well, okay, so politics can uh, clearly affect uh, consumer economics. So um, I think that one's a little obvious. So we, we keep dropping the price of oil and uh, Russia is going to have a tough time uh, with the, economically speaking. And that's right. going to have a ripple effect on the consumer side uh, eventually. But um, so politics does play a part um, clearly uh, in, the, in the health of our industry. But I think that uh, cultivating um, the development and the publishing uh, companies uh, is something that we look at carefully. Who's friendly? we're finding a lot of people are. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. I think that, again, if you look especially at <clears throat> the mobile market, that reflects very well on what games are in top grossing charts um, and so on. So again, Russia is a lot more open and a lot more friendly, and so a lot of the companies have actually gone ahead and set up offices there, like Glue Mobile and Machine Zone and Game Loft and, and so on. Uh, whereas China is obviously a lot harder because it is very political and you have to obtain um, a lot of licenses and you have to work with the local operators and so on. So it is pretty complicated and so I think that slows down a lot of the yes. content coming through. Uh, and I think that the other kind of the flip side of the equation um, 
is how politics impact actually how people and consumers, how they actually play games. And again, from in Russian example, obviously we all know there has been a recent crisis um, and a lot of people were predicting, obviously people due to the weakness of the currency, maybe spending less uh, money on games and so on. Um, but what we've seen has actually been the opposite because people can spend less money on things like entertainment and going to movies and buying cars and so on. They've actually turned to gaming and so they've, they've spend a lot of their time instead of going out to restaurants they actually come back home and started playing and so that in in a sense benefited gaming and kind of helps bootstrap more growth in a sense. we we talked a little bit about um the audience and uh i think julia you mentioned youtube um in, in part of your answer is YouTube as big an influencer to consumers in uh, these markets? I don't. I don't think YouTube is in China, but um, uh, you know, is is it as big as it has become here? Um, perhaps, arguably, bigger than the enthusiast press. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, from working with developers, what we hear in the local market, uh, definitely is. And there are, I think, obviously there are influencers in those countries all have to be local and we definitely see people content creators like coming up um, and creating their own kind of unique channels that people are watching i think um in russia at the moment there is this young girl i don't know if you've heard of her called karina something anyway so it is a great way for for those influencers to like monetize their content as well and obviously they chat to people and create engagement um and so i think this girl, she's probably about 14 or 15, and she essentially allows people to um, like send her controversial comments. She swears a lot, and she creates all of that um, character and so on. Uh, and that kind of went viral and um, through the roof. So that's really interesting. But I think for developers, it's the I mean, YouTubers and influencers are there. It's just about finding the right fit for your game. Um, and I don't know if you're seeing a lot of that with World of Tanks because obviously yeah. it is very local to that market too. Yeah, I mean, the, the answer is, I totally agree, is yes, for sure. I, you know, I think in, uh, in Russia we have, uh, there's like three, three uh, YouTubers who have like something like five million, you know, uh, in total subscribers. And, you know, for that size of a country, I mean, that, that's pretty big um, alone. We don't, we don't find the same dynamic necessarily here in the U.S., but then, then you go to Brazil, and actually, I mean, YouTube is everything. I mean, YouTube mm -hmm. and Facebook is everything, and people are living it out there, and um, uh, that's where uh, discovery is happening uh, in, in, in so many ways. Um, and that's things that, that that's, it's such a fascinating thing, because we, we, we can only try to support and nurture and cultivate um, that phenomenon um, that's a phenomenon that we're trying to um, embrace. I think a lot of companies started uh, with thinking they had to control the message. You know, we're going to be the ones to speak to the, to the players, and we don't. We're, we're very afraid of what um, you know, what people are talking about when they when they're considering our, our title. You know, what's the message? And we realized, no, no, no. Let's go the entirely the other way, and let's just give it out to, to everybody to to run with. Um, I'd rather have ten people. Uh, you know, with five to ten thousand people and subscribers to their channel, uh, than one channel for us. Um, that's uh, you know half of that, um, because that's a lot more influential. In fact, player to player to player uh, kind of communication uh, than we can ever deliver. So, so there's so much more trust when you yeah. actually look at player to player communication rather than like engineered high production value content that's coming from developers themselves, right? Yeah, you've got to go where they are too. I mean, I uh, was talking to our team uh, before this and saying, you know, there are, I think, five million uh, Facebook fans in Brazil, uh, which is one million more than we have for the Ubisoft corporate page, right? Hmm. That uh, that sort of annoys the people sitting back in Paris. We think, why can't we be that popular? But it's because the Brazil team has done a great job of going where the fans are. They've shifted, uh, they've shifted their community management there. They've shifted it to online communities. Um, they've really put a lot of time and attention there because, like you said, mm -hmm. they're going where the players are. They're going where the players are going to spend their most time talking about the game, being involved in the game. Um, uh, I forget the name of the social network in, in, in Russia that's equally as big as YouTube. It starts with the Y, but it's, it's the same thing for Russia for us as well. You know, they're, they're really 
uh, heavily investing in making sure they're going where the players are. We've been talking about um, these three markets and sort of blending them together a little bit. Um, are there any similarities um, in China and Russia, Brazil, that can be exploited, or does each require a very different approach to uh, to get the audience? I think it's again, like I said, it's 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 it's, it's the similar but different. Um, and actually, we've covered a lot here today so far, mm -hmm. and talking about you know po uh, uh, the politics. You know, okay, okay, I can't go into China the same way I can't. You know, the same way I go into Brazil, so right. politically speaking. Um, so similar but different is, is how you need to approach and, and look carefully. For, for Wargaming uh, America, we try to um, initially just say, oh, you know, we, we can buy display advertising from here for, for Brazil. And I could, you know, why wouldn't I do it? I'm already buying here. Uh, I'm running community and running content. I'll just get some people who speak Portuguese and then we'll start translating our videos and, and doing it. No, you know, we, we, we saw, we, 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 when we started to do that, we, we moved the needle uh, a bit, um, and then we started working with some local partners, local events, and it just, and they, they, they were like, okay, that was nice what you guys were doing, but you should do it like this. And I said, okay, why don't you go ahead and, and show me the way and, and let's connect. Um, and when we started to doing that, we had our, uh, organic personalities emerge from the community, uh, the grassroots uh, Competitive uh, gaming, actually in Brazil, is huge, 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 and much bigger uh, than our uh, uh, grassroots or amateur league in the U.S. And they're like, you know, 15% the size as, as far as audience. And we're like, okay, we, we got to cultivate this. And the only way we, we could do it was by having people on the ground uh, make it happen. So um, that was something that was, you know, a great lesson to learn. Uh, we just said, okay, we were stupid, uh, but now we learned and let, let, let's go further and faster. Yeah, I think, um, uh, like you said, I think markets are similar in a lot of ways. For example, Russia and um, China, they are very, very PC dominated, right? Um, so if you are thinking about building a game, or if you're a PC developer, um, it is all, when thinking about genres as well, if you're probably uh, developing like a game for something around strategy, RPG, MMO, maybe in the war space, um, Russia is probably a good market to go to and, and so is China in a way. If you're thinking about a casual mobile game, um, Brazil is probably a better place for that. So I think China and Russia are similar in a way that uh, culture is so much more like dominant and so you really need to think about like localizing the content and localizing your I mean building the relationship with the local publishers and local partners um, and so on well actually I want to bring up localization too because that's um, that's so critical in building that audience and talking directly um, to it um, Mike, do you have? I'm not sure if you, if you have staffing numbers with you for um, the uh, the units, but if we don't even have exact numbers, is there a larger team working in, say, China versus Russia, or? Um... Yeah, the, the team in China is definitely larger across the two studios. I think it's I want to say north of 200 people um, in Chengdu. I'm not sure how many exactly in Shanghai. Russia right now, I want to say, is about. 50 people, or that might be where they're they're trying to get to um, by the end of this year. Um, so we have a smaller team in Russia. It is a smaller uh, traditional kind of traditional uh, retail games market, but it's something that we're that we're growing into and expanding onto. Um, as Jay said, you know, community management um, is hugely important for us. You can't really do community management from North America for a Russian audience, right? That just it doesn't work. Um, you know, we expanded our even our customer service. Uh, the number of languages and the number of locations that we had customer service available in has expanded uh, probably twofold or threefold in the past year. And that's because we need to address these players where they are. Again, I'm going back to that same point. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of other localization, you know, localization of content is equally important. Um, so we have, a, we have a studio and a team in, in Pune in India, um, and they worked on uh, Just Dance Now. So I don't know. How many people are familiar with Just Dance? But it's a music game that was kind of created on the Wii and became a huge sensation. 
um, you know, biggest selling dance game or biggest selling music game of all time. Uh, we created a mobile version, uh, and the mobile version allows you to play on your phone. Um, really, really great tracks and choreography for Western markets. Uh, what we found is that uh, in India, people have their own songs that they want to listen to. They have their own songs that they want to dance to. So the Pune team said, okay, you know, we can take this, we can apply uh, an Indian song, it's called India Wale, from this hit movie called Happy New Year. Um, they created the map, they created the chore choreography for it, and it became, you know, the best, the most uh, viewed and most played song in Just Dance Now in, in India. Um, Brazil is the, the, top, uh, the top market for that game, right? Um, so again, kind of speaking to the cultural differences, um, whereas Just Dance, the console game, may not have been as huge in Brazil. Just Dance Now took off. I mean, it became just a huge thing, this huge phenomenon in Brazil. I totally um, want to play a Bollywood version of Just Dance Now. The song is amazing. The song will stick in your head for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting. Russia is almost like a hub between the West and China. You see a lot of Chinese developers launching games in Russia first because they, the culture and kind of the audience is so much closer to them. And so again, if you look at what games are popular, you'll see Chinese developers actually among the top um, in Russia. So games like Clash of Kings from LX, which is a Chinese developer. Um, and the other way around, like US publishers and developers bringing their games to Russia to kind of test the ground before they bring them into China because the audience is somewhat similar in a sense. We're going to be opening this up for questions also, so if, you, if anyone has a question, feel free to walk up to the mic here and, uh, and we'll be happy to call on you. And while people are deciding if they have anything, I'm, I'm curious, what are the biggest areas of weaknesses that you guys have for your companies in these, these emerging markets? And it seems so strange to call China an emerging market <laughs> since it's bigger than the U.S., but yeah. you know. Getting into China. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, is, is that the I, actually, hardest not, not to be funny, I mean, but think, think just like you said, the market is huge. Uh, I mean, let, let's, let's uh, close our eyes and imagine that it was open right now. I mean, we, we'd all, as Western companies, be, be in there learning, you know, stumbling, making mistakes, but learning and iterating and uh, uh, moving a lot faster, um, probably, you know, to, towards a... Uh, a, de a higher degree of prosperity, if you will, because we know the market is hungry and, and is desirous of uh, the content that we have. So I'd say it's a weakness right now, but in fact, if you take a long-term view on it, um, we're very hopeful uh, for the future there. Um, but um, I, I know, you know, being an operator, um, you know, of a service, uh, just the complexity. So what we're talking about, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, how do you get this right? Um, you know, for if the games in over 40 languages and, you know, major markets all around the world, it's complex as, as anything, um, uh, especially, you know, in a, in a free-to-play, you know, live MMO persistent, you know, world, um, staying in step with your... Uh, uh, on all the servers, the content is, is in similar places, the experiences of, um, you know, have their similarities and their differences. And when you're deploying new features, new updates, um, just keeping it together, I, I would say, is one of the biggest complexities we have. But mm. it's, a, it's a fun problem to, to, to solve. It's a luxury problem, I, I, I consider. Yeah, I would say, you know, we touched on it a little bit earlier. We've got socioeconomic or political uh, kind of challenges or, or, or changes that are happening in a lot of these countries. So, you know, when, when inflation is spiking plus 10% in Brazil, that changes people's ability to price games and market games and to buy games. That changes, you know, when, there's, when there are social protests or uprisings, that changes what they're thinking about, um, where they're spending their time. Um, so it's bigger than us. It's bigger than, it's bigger than video games. Um, but those, you know, because that's the nature of emerging markets. Um, you know, it's also, like you said, it's, it's where we see opportunity as well because if we, can, if we can be there and we can understand it and we can adapt to it, um, then, then it's, that's opportunity for us. It's green field for us. I guess for Facebook, there's no Facebook in China yet. <laughs> so you have a real hard time getting that market. 
<laughs> so that's probably the biggest challenge. I wonder how it would do. <laughs> <laughs> do you, uh, the, a lot of the large game companies like Electronic Arts and Take-Two Interactive um, partner with someone like Tencent. Is that um, the best way to get in the market? It's the only way. It's yeah. the only okay. way. That's it. That yeah, was we, easy. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Um, actually, you guys just touched on it a moment ago. Um, pricing of games. Here in America, uh, normally when somebody says a free to play game, you expect somewhere along there's going to be 99 cents. And that purchases. Um, in this particular case, though, we're talking about a monthly purchase of $10. Mm-hmm. And so that's why we can get into that game and then get into the on their investment in, in, in these emerging markets considering the low amounts that they can sometimes pay for those games. Yeah, I, let me add on to that question because I, I think it's a great question, um, but I know that Russia also is very cash-based in its economy, so how do you handle those sort of payments as well? Yeah, that's so excellent question. Um, so I, I'm, for, for Wargaming, for World of Tanks, uh, we actually use even though we're free to play, it doesn't mean it's synonymous necessarily with uh, with micro micro transaction. Um, and the game doesn't. We, we don't really go 99 cent. We uh, we build value packages that are usually a little bit higher, um, but we do look at them across the globe um, and try to create packages um, that can be uh, it will be better received, uh, if you will. So you know. Um, premium time, premium, uh, like bundling different pieces of, of valuable content uh, to make a compelling offer that we feel that, that can be sustained uh, in the marketplace. But uh, absolutely, as far as cash-based economies, uh, uh, Russia as well as uh, in, in Brazil, that, so that gets into that conversation about offering multiple methods of payment, um, you know, less credit card use, if, if you will. and. Uh, adopting and adapting. So again, that's the sort of the actual operational complexities, getting people uh, into the market. We we didn't understand. We said, "Hey, Visa, American Express, everybody's got it, right?" I mean, <laughs> and uh, no, that's clearly not the case. And uh, so you have to start working with uh, and understanding that uh, locally. But uh, long-term view. Uh, we we try to take a long-term view. The more players we have, ultimately, uh, we can sustain the ups and downs um, in the economics. Um, if we're uh, if we're fortunate in scaling uh, a free-to-play experience, uh, but so the answer is yes. You have to look very closely at that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think Chris, to your question about payment methods. Um, I think both Russia and Brazil are really similar in that sense. Probably forty percent of the payments go mm. through cash terminals, what they call them. And so if you don't know what that is, it's essentially you have an online account that you can top up through a cash terminal that you can find in places like train stations and just outside. And um, so you just go in and put whatever, $10 equivalent in rubles. Um, and that tops up your online account. Um, and then you can, and games like World of Tanks will have that. Um, <laughs> So the Russian one is called Kiwi. I'm um, not sure what's the equivalent in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And so you can essentially anonymously spend um, cash payments in those games. So you never really have to reveal your you know, identity or credit card details. But I think that's changing a lot. A lot mm-hmm. of people are gaining trust and credit card payments are growing um, a lot. Yeah, we see we see people paying in PayPal and Kiwi and other online services in Russia a lot. Um, you know, in China there's there's SMS payment. Uh, again, the mobile okay. the mobile uh, market is so huge and so dominant in China. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I think it's a reason why Western publishers, quote unquote, Western publishers, are are looking at more free to play options um, when it comes to China as well. You've got you know 150,000 internet cafes where people go to to play these games. Um, and and that's where they're going to go and, and pay to play these games as well. So um, it's a, it's really about adjusting to the to the model that the market is most comfortable with. I think. Gotcha. Got the class, and it's very similar but slightly different for each individual area. Right. Well, thank you. Appreciate the answers. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, hello. Uh, thanks for this. This is really interesting. Uh, I wonder if um, you 
Like how far in advance do you start to think about the next market to advance into? And I'm thinking especially about India, because I think mm. India is the next massive market, and then beyond that would be the continent of Africa, but I think that's in several decades away. Um, and um, a sort of parallel note to that is, do you ever work with linguists or anthropologists when you expand into a new market? And um, just because you talked about localization and realizing that you can't just translate you know, from English to Portuguese, it has to be specific and also specific to a certain neighborhood maybe or um, county or something, so. Yeah, we, we have, um, I'll, I'll answer the localization part first, I guess. Um, we have a localization team, a very good and big localization team at Ubisoft. We have the benefit of being a big company, so we can, mm. we can do that. And, and that, is, you know, that is their job, is to, is to figure out how to localize the game in, yeah. um, in as many languages as we're going to be selling the game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you're, if you're selling the game in Arabic, you have to figure out how to make sure that the controls uh, aren't going in the same direction as they would be if you're in a Western market, right? You're reading in a different, you're reading in a different direction, that, so the mm -hmm. controls need to map to that. Mm -hmm. um, so they do look at all of those things. Um, you know, once the game is locked and they start to think about localization, it's a very important part of the, part of the process for us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if either you want to talk about the India versus other emerging markets. Um, you know, I think, um, I, I think you're right. I think it is a, it is a big market. We're, we're looking at, we are looking at the Middle East as well. We're looking at, um, you know, Abu Dhabi, Dubai. Um, we think there's a lot of opportunity there. We opened up a studio in Abu Dhabi a few years ago um, because we did see a lot of potential there. Mm -hmm. um, they've been working on mobile games uh, and having some success, CSI, uh, Smurfs, some other things. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely dipping our toes in the water there. Yeah, it's, you know, it's what we've been discussing a bit, population size uh, for sure. And then, and then you look at, you know, the infrastructure. Yeah. Is the infrastructure there? Yeah. So for, for a game, again, like uh, for World of Warships or World of Tanks, you know, 15 to 18 gigabyte download, Mm -hmm. um, you need uh, to have a good, and we, you want it to be a good experience. So if I, I can't really offer something that's going to take somebody a full day, you know, to get to. And uh, so we'll be very careful about, you know, measuring and metering our approach to a marketplace before we know it can be a good experience. Yeah. Uh, latency, ping rates, uh, that, you know, would, would then come second. And then say, okay, um, once we, uh, once uh it reaches certain thresholds, we say, okay, now, now let's advance and let, 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 let's go and let's try. I mean, uh, linguistically speaking, you know, fortunately, we, you know, we don't have characters or story really, so there's no dialogue, so I don't have to, I, I mean, so that, that's something that's off our plate, <laughs> thankfully. Um, so it's not as complex as uh, mm. uh, some of the other games that are out there. But um, again, I would say though, however, it comes down to, uh, being local with putting, because we're constantly putting out content, however, um, and so having the right people do it, and so um, that's super important, mm -hmm. and how we connect with it. Yeah, I would agree, um, especially on the infrastructure point. Obviously, China is massive, and infrastructure is so well developed, and the government is invested in making sure people are on the internet. Um, the local, local operators are as well. Whereas um, in India, for example, there's a massive amount of work is to be done to just connect people to the internet and like the penetration of smartphones is growing massively, mostly Android, mostly low-end devices. And so the connection of those phones is still very much like, 2G mostly. So to bring high-end uh, content and for people to be able to monetize is going to be um, a long time. But I think that obviously it is moving in that direction. Not gaming specifically, but Facebook is working on initiatives like internet.org. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To make sure that we're just getting people on the internet and providing them with the basic services. Obviously, it's very far from gaming yet, but it's <laughs> just to get people to get on the internet for the first time because um, mostly it's not because they can't afford it, it's because they grew up not using their internet at all and so they just yeah. don't understand the value and I'm, so yeah I think it's it's a very long process um, and it is very much organic it's, it's happening there are a lot of um, initiatives but I guess for big publishers like Ubisoft like Wargaming and so on 
for the market to become attractive, um, it really has to mature quite a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So we're uh, we're out of time here, but I want to thank everyone once again for coming out this afternoon, uh, and thank our panelists as well. Some really good information. Everyone have thank a good Thanksgiving. Uh, not Thanksgiving. St. Patrick's. Have a good Thanksgiving too. <laughs>